Hey folks, here to do a little bit of background on Beowulf. Uh, Beowulf is the first, uh, you know, real story of, of any length to be recorded as a work of fiction, to be recorded in the uh, Anglo-Saxon language. Uh, we know some things about it. Um, we don't know when it was, was first told. We know it probably came from oral tradition, uh, but we know that it was written down for the first time uh, over here in England, in Mercia, um, around uh, between the, the years of 800 and 1200 CE. That's a pretty big range, like a 400 year range. I'm, I'm of the opinion that it was written in the 830s because um, the setting of uh, Beowulf takes place over here uh, in Denmark. Um, there's this island uh, that has this great mead hall on it called Herat. Uh, the king is this guy named Hrothgar um, of Denmark. These are real historical, it's a real historical place and a real historical figure. Um, you know, and so it's set in, inside this box, if you can imagine, in southern Sweden, northern Germany, ar around 450 CE. So the setting is, you know, at least 400 years before it was written, uh, which is the equivalent of me writing about George Washington today. So it's sort of like this mythical um, thing. Uh, the time period during which it takes place is a time that was called the Dark Ages because nothing was written. But um, back in like the, the Victorian times, they, they didn't refer to it to the as the Dark Ages so much as the Age of Heroes because, which sounds so much more like a cool video game, the Age of Heroes, right? Like, it's when all of these great heroes uh, of, of Europe sort of lived. Um, you know, the, the British have Beowulf, but they also have King Arthur, um, you know, and in the northern Germanic countries are Siegfried and Sigmund, um, there's Charlemagne, there's, you know, Roland, there's like all of these, there's Theodric, there's all of these famous guys. And of course, the bad guy in a lot of these stories was this horrible guy named Attila the Hun. It's pretty cool. You can read a bunch of old legends and stories that are all sort of set in this time period when they didn't have any written history. Um, but uh, the reason I think that Beowulf, they know Beowulf was written here. Uh, in England, where this axe is, because of the the accent it was written in, it was written um, you know back before they had standardized spelling, and so people just wrote things the way they sounded, and uh, so all of the accents of the writers were captured in their writing because they would write with their own accent, uh, and so we know based on the accent uh, that the guy who wrote it was from Mercia. Uh, Mercia was under the control of Danish Viking kings uh, in the 1800s. So it makes the most sense that Beowulf was originally written, uh, did I say 1800s? In the 800s. Um, it makes the most sense that Beowulf was written, um, you know, for a Danish overlord by a, a priest who was trying to convert him from his old pagan religion to um, the more modern Christian religion. And uh, that makes sense. Like you can sort of see uh, that, you know, subtext in the story, and we'll talk about it as time goes on. Um, the reason that the upward date of Beowulf is 1280, because we only have one copy, original copy of Beowulf left, and that copy we've carbon dated to be written around 1200. Um, now, it's a copy of an original, so we don't know when the original was written, but that's the ultimate last date it possibly could have been written, which is the carbon dating of the, the manuscript itself. Um, I don't know how many else, how many other people geek out about these things, but that's me. So it was written in England, but it's about Denmark. So the story is going to be set over here. It's going to be set specifically, um, you know, Beowulf is from this place called Geatland, which is in present southern day Sweden. It's a city now called Gotland. It's not its own country. Uh, you can look that up if you want to. Um, he's he's our hero, uh, and so he's from over here, uh, but he's going to um, Herat, which is where the king uh, of Denmark lived at the time. His name was Rothgar, uh, and it's on one of these islands. Um, you know, he was a sea king. He was a king who, who sailed around with fleets of Viking longships and raided and pillaged and got rich, and um, his story is pretty interesting. So let me uh, let me move forward here. I don't know, that didn't work. Let's try that again. Uh, let me move forward here. Here is, um, let's see if I can move myself out of, out of the picture's way. Uh, here is old King Rothgar. Um, you know, he is King of the Danes. That H is silent, so his name sort of comes off as Rothgar. Uh, he is very old. He is very rich from all of his raiding and pillaging. Uh, and he used to be the most powerful king. Um, and with his wealth and his power, and, and partially because he's... Um, He's in, in a long line of powerful kings. The first king of Denmark was this guy named Schild, who just like Moses or whatever, like showed up like floating down a river on a, on a 
you know, reed basket or whatever. And he was an orphan and he grew up and he became this great king and unified the Danish people. And then he had a son named Beo, not related to Beowulf, um, who was a great king as well and made Denmark even more powerful. And then Beo had a son named uh, Half Dane who made Denmark even more powerful. And Half Dane had three sons, Hergar and um, Hrothgar and... Herbald, maybe I don't remember the last one's name. It doesn't matter. Uh, but Hrothgar was the second son. He was never meant to be king. And when his older brother died in battle, he ended up becoming king. And he's had this inferiority complex his entire life, looking at his ancestors, looking at his older brother, feeling like he doesn't live up. And so he decides to do something with all of this wealth uh, to, to sort of make a mark for himself. And he decides to build the greatest building that's ever been built in Northern Europe. And this building is called Herat. And this is just sort of an image of what it might have looked like. It was built on top of a hill so it could be seen by everybody it was the largest meat hall built to look like valhalla up there in um you know asgard and uh the the important things about it is he spared no expense in the construction you know like he he you know if, if you hear legendary accounts of the building and the building did exist was it as great as legend says probably not but if you hear legendary accounts of the building you know like he brought in um you know special cedar trees from the mediterranean to to help build the um i guess a framework um he used whale bones in the uh ceiling to help you know hold it up and and they were all carved everything inside was carved with designs the floor was tiled um some with some accounts are with tin and some with copper but whatever the case the tiles were like shaped into scenes of the history of denmark so that you could see the history of denmark on the floor of the hall um the the roof uh was the most important part about um about herat uh and the roof of herat was tiled or tiled shingled We'll go with shingled. It was shingled with gold shingles that were all polished, and so wherever you were sailing in that sea, there um, you could see the the sun glinting off of this hall, and so it was this great, great achievement to build Herat, the hall, the greatest building in the north. Um, so uh, he's he's one of your characters that you really need to know. It's Old King. Um, the next character you need to know is Beowulf. Um, Beowulf is our epic hero. Uh, he's, um, his name literally translates into bear wolf. So, you know, you think Wolverine sounds like an impressive hero name. No, uh, you know, bear wolf. Uh, he's pretty intense. He's a nephew of the King of Geatland. Like I said, Geatland's in Southern, um, present day Sweden. It doesn't exist anymore except as a city. Sweden conquered Geatland, uh, back when they were clans. Uh, but Beowulf's got these intense attributes. He's young. He's just coming of age. He doesn't have any great songs or stories told about him because he hasn't completed any of those tasks yet. Uh, but he's like six foot eight, um, and he's got the strength of 30 men, which means like when he makes a bicep, it makes that twisty leather noise, you know, and uh, he's he's really intense. Um, his other superhuman ability is that he has unlimited swimming powers. Um which doesn't sound super great unless you're, you know, a Viking and you're on a ship. Uh, he doesn't get affected by the temperature of the water. Uh, he can swim for any number of hours without getting tired. He can swim in full armor, and it doesn't seem to make him drown or sink. Uh, he can also hold his breath for an unlimited amount of time. And so, um, you know, he's sort of like Hulk and Aquaman combined. Um, his, his final attribute is that he's fearless. He doesn't seem to have any kind of fear of anything um, ever. Uh, and so he's he's willing to face any danger or any situation uh, because he, he's not troubled with human weaknesses like fear. Uh, and that's cool. Uh, and his, his pivot against, and this is just to help you out, you know, if you're going to have a if you're going to have an epic hero, if you're going to have a, a character who has um, greater than human attributes, he's got to be facing a villain who has greater than human attributes as well. And of course, the villain of this story um, is uh, sort of a, a pre-werewolf, if you will, named Grendel. Um, Grendel's name translates into the Destroyer, uh, and he's got a number of attributes that make him more than a match for Beowulf, so that Beowulf um, seems outgunned here. Uh, so I say pre-werewolf because, you know, like he's never adequately described. We don't know... Um, we don't know his attributes aside from the fact that he's he's vicious. He only comes out at night. He's bloodthirsty. He has hell forged hands and teeth and claws. And um, his mother is described as a she wolf, um, you know, which makes you think that somehow he is 
wolfish in attributes. Uh, so his name translates into the destroyer. Uh, he's a descendant of Cain uh, from the Bible. Cain is is the first murderer. He murdered his brother Abel and therefore is the first human being to be sent to hell. And so he's got this hellish bloodline. Um, he's also got the strength of 30 men. He can kill 30 guys and pick up their corpses and go back to his hole and eat them like a bag of Doritos. Um, you know, and so he's got he's got enormous strength. Uh, he's got these hell-forged claws. That's a kenning that they use in the story. He basically puts his, his hands down at the hell, I guess, at some point, and Satan's like, ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. Perfect. Right? And these hell-forged claws can cut through armor like it's butter. It doesn't even affect them. Um, then he's immune to damage from weapons. Now, nobody knows this. You find it out as you read the story, so I guess I'm spoiling it a little bit, but I think it helps you to picture uh, what Beowulf's up against. Beowulf doesn't know that Grendel's immune to weapons. Um, but he's he's had magic spells cast on him that makes his hide uh, proof against weapons of all kind. Anybody who hits him with a weapon, it doesn't do any good, which is yet another link to the werewolf, right? Because you need like the silver bullet or something to hurt a werewolf. You can't hurt a werewolf um, with a regular weapon. Um, and then finally, his, his last attributes is that his, his glowing red eyes seem to cause fear in anybody who looks at them. And so, um, you know, he, he creates fear wherever he is. And of course, this augments the rest of his powers because, you know, if he has Hellforge claws that cut through armor like butter, and if he's immune to weapons, well, and if he causes fear in everybody he sees, well, if you're going to be brave enough to go fight him, you better believe you're going to put on the best armor and find the best weapon that you possibly can to fight this thing. Well, the armor is just going to slow you down. It's not going to stop his claws at all. So really, you're, you're encumbering yourself with a heavy suit of armor that doesn't do you any good. And your weapon um, is not going to cut him at all. So no matter what weapon you get, you're really just, you know, making it so that he's going to kill you. And that's, uh, I think, the, the combination of powers that make Grendel so terrifying. Um, he's almost an a incarnation of terror and fear and hate uh, in the story, almost symbolic of those things, uh, but definitely connected to nature. He lives in a swamp as opposed to up on this hill of Herat. Um, he's an exile. He's not... Um, connected to society at all. It doesn't follow any of society's laws. So I think that's enough background to give you sort of a setup for the story, and hopefully you're, you're interested and engaged. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to type them down below, and I will do my best to answer them. Um, thanks for watching. Yeah, that's not working. Let's try this.